<laughs> Thank you, everyone, for joining us in the last of our 10-part series on World War II in the Pacific. I hope you've all enjoyed it up to this point. I know I certainly have. And no matter how many times you come to different lectures, you always get something new out of each and every one that you didn't know. And it's amazing. And forgive us this evening, we had a little technical difficulty. We moved the screen down a little bit, we moved it down so far we couldn't quite get it back. So we got it back up. So thank you all for coming this evening. And as we begin all of our programs here at the Silver Sides, we begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. If you are capable, please stand while we say the thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. With this being our tenth and final lecture in our spring lecture series, I want to continue to thank our wonderful sponsors for these, what, these lectures that we've had thus far. The Birch Foundation out of Holland, Michigan, has always provided wonderful support to these lectures and makes it possible for the museum to serve its mission of honoring veterans through education and preservation. And we thank them for doing this. They are a wonderful couple that met during World War II, and upon return from their service in World War II, they came back to Holland and started a family. They both worked in public service, and they felt that the best way to honor your country is to become a part of it. Yeah, and how better to become a part working? of it than through education. And so through them, we are able to provide these series. Additionally, we would like to thank the um, Blue Lake Public Radio for being our media sponsor. They do an excellent job of telling the world about our programs, and we could not be as wonderful as we are without them. So thank you very much to them. It's been a wonderful journey through the Pacific this spring. <laughs> and there's been so many twists and turns and things that have changed and stories that we didn't know about that we've learned about. Tonight will be our final lecture on that. But before we get to the very end, Teresa has a special presentation on the very beginning about a young man's recollection of what it was like to be in Pearl Harbor as the planes went by. And so for that, I will turn it over to Teresa. And I'll just speak from back here because I've had enough technology outsmarting me, so I'm not wandering too far from this thing. <laughs> it's just not being nice to me tonight. But I know several times when I was here speaking to you guys earlier, I mentioned that I was going to sneak into archives when nobody was looking and find this for you before the series ended. It is the last night, so I'm making it in, but still making it in. And the curator doesn't need to know I was in there. As Maggie said, though, one of our sponsors is the Birch um, Fred Birch and his wife Lorraine, and we just thought it might be helpful for you to know a little bit more about who he is. So give me one minute and I will, I think, get this all going. So a little background music. It all started on that Sunday morning that seems so long ago and that yet seems very recent. I had been aroused at 0730 to accompany our football team over to where they often used recreational facilities that were extended by a sugar company there. There were only two officers aboard beside myself and the officer of the deck, and both of them, quite naturally on a Sunday morning, were in their sacks. Although I was not a witness to this incident, it bears repeating. Johnny, who had the deck, saw the first explosion on Ford Island and assumed that it was a fire. He ran into Mr. Shepard's room, aroused him, and said there was a fire on Ford Island. Should he send the fire and rescue party? The answer, of course, was yes. When Johnny again went on deck, there was another bomb. He ran back in and said, Mr. Shepard, there's two of them. By the time he looked again, there were innumerable bursts on the island, and he realized that we were engaged. For me, things happened quite differently. I was shaving when GQ went on the destroyer moored to starboard in the nest. Only a moment passed before she opened up with her forward machine guns practically over my head. Since the Navy lives on drills, I thought this to be another, and the possibility of it being the real McCoy hardly entered my head. 
At that moment, the destroyer outboard of us sounded GQ and all of her automatic weapons opened fire. GQ sounded on the case. Still thinking this to be a super drill, I ran from my battle station in one of the fire rooms. As I reached the waist of the ship, a plane roared in out of the blue and my jaw dropped some six inches when I saw the great red ball on its side. This was a dive bomber that had already dropped its egg. He had the side of his cockpit pushed back and he grinned as he looked the whole nest over because he knew darn well that all of our bullets were passing behind him. As I watched the tracers flicking past him astern, I wished to hell that some of our people had done a little more duck hunting during their youth. We were alongside a tender, so of course our plant was completely disabled. There was nothing to do until parts started to come back from the tender. I went to the bridge and as I arrived I watched the enemy dive bombers start their runs on Battleship Row. They were peeling off high above the Arizona and as I watched I could see the bombs falling. There was a moment of quiet after those first few struck and then occurred the most awe-inspiring sight that I have ever seen the ascension unto heaven of the forward part of the Arizona. You have read about our losses. By this time, there were masts reeling at various angles throughout the harbor. Ships were afire, and we were fearful of submarines in the harbor, since several of the midget variety had been sunk early in the action. Let me just leave that. One, our nest had shot down four planes, every one that had approached except the first one. We aboard the case settled down to putting things back together while bombs were still dropping around us. In the afternoon, we were ready to go. One midget submarine in the channel was still belching out air, and to ensure its demise, we were delegated to drop a depth charge on it as we left. This is indeed ticklish business in water as shallow as that. I was delegated to guide the ship from a motor whaleboat directly over the sub several hundred yards away. As the ship steadied on a course for the sub, several hundred yards away, I pulled out. When the charge went off, I was several hundred yards from it. When an ash can explodes in water that shallow, water and mud are hurled 200 feet in the air. The day's activities were making me feel just a little bit insignificant. None of us had any great hopes of living for another 48 hours, for we didn't know what lay outside. But all during the day, the fire room gang worked to get our gear back together, singing, why don't we do this more often? The same song, the one playing right now, rang through the gratings as we steamed out of the harbor to meet whatever the Japs had out there. I will always have a soft spot in my heart for this song. wanted to share that with you since so you'd know a little bit more about the couple that was sponsoring this lecture series and now I'm glad I went before Ron because he speaks so well I didn't want to go after him but that's kind of how World War II in the Pacific started and now we're going to hand it over to Ron who's probably going to share with us how World War II in the Pacific ended. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Teresa. Thanks, Peggy. Uh, I know everybody in here can hear me all right. How about uh, you folks out in the ether? Can you hear me? Do I need to use the microphone? Yes. I do need to use the microphone. All right. <laughs> General Yamamoto. Excuse me, Admiral. Admiral Yamamoto, <laughs> the architect of the Pearl Harbor attack that we just saw. Yamamoto probably knew Americans and the United States better than any other ranking Japanese official in 1941. He had spent time as an aide. He had gone to graduate school at, I think it was Yale or Harvard. Uh, he had worked in the, uh, in the Japanese embassy. He knew the American state of mind. He knew the potential of the United States economy. He felt that with a strong enough knockout blow, Japan would have a chance. But it had to be a knockout blow. If it went beyond, all bets were off. 
it did go beyond. From 1941 to 1945, we were engaged in a life and death struggle with the Japanese Empire, as were other allies, and of course, in Europe as well. But tonight's subject is about the war in the Pacific. And we fought the Japanese for those four terrible years, and it was often touch and go. It would be four brutal years. We've seen bits and pieces of this activity over the past nine, ten weeks. Ten weeks ago, I came in and I gave you a presentation on Pearl Harbor. But since then, we've seen bits and pieces. I thought it would be fitting to try to capture all of those pieces and get an overview, a broad view of how the war unfolded in the Pacific. And so that's what I'm doing tonight. Ultimately, the Japanese Empire was vanquished and disappeared, like any number of ships that the Silver Side sent below the waves. It was fought in the air, at sea, on land, and had figures that were larger than life that we still remember today. But ultimately, all this came together, and the Allied forces sank the rising sun. That will be my presentation tonight. I am Lieutenant Colonel Ron Janowski, and I'm darn glad to be here. <laughs> Pearl Harbor, as we've just saw, seen, was intended to be a knockout punch. Yamamoto knew that without knocking out the entire fleet of the U.S. Navy in the Pacific, Japan did not have a chance of dominating in the Pacific. And dominate was exactly what they wanted to do. This was no vengeful act. It was no act of, uh, you know, of schoolyard bully. They had a plan, and that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. Their intention was to knock out the American fleet as the major competition to the Japanese dominating fully dominating for the rest of the 20th century in the Pacific Theater. At Pearl Harbor, they did some incredible things. They managed to get a 19-ship flotilla to travel 3,600 miles across uncharted, no, that's not the right word, unused Pacific Ocean. They were outside the sea lanes. Other ships that were crossing the Pacific were normally further south. They went through an area of the Pacific that was not normally used. They did it silently. They did it efficiently. They got those 19 ships traveling 3,600 miles and committed one of the most outstanding military operations ever and caught the United States completely by surprise. To fully appreciate this is almost impossible because some 86 years earlier, the Japanese were medieval until the United States Admiral Perry visited them in 1855. They were fighting on horseback with swords and spears. And yet, they were so impressed by the West and they were so determined by the West to capture and catch up to what the West had demonstrated to them that a mere 86 years later, they're able to do this. Phenomenal. They did it with precise planning. They did it with state-of-the-art technology. And they were able to commit what we know as the great attack on Pearl Harbor. They made mistakes. Three in particular. Chester Nimitz, the admiral who took over in Pearl Harbor after the attack, was asked about a month later what he assessed of the damage. And he said, well, God was looking out for us. <laughs> and the reporter said, God was looking out for us? What in the world are you talking about? And Nimitz said, the Japanese failed to do three things that will doom them over the next however long it takes. First of all, they did not damage our dry docks. 
They attacked our ships, they sank our ships, they destroyed ships in the harbor, which was shallow. If the ships had been outside the harbor, they would have sank in many fathoms of water and perhaps been irrecoverable. But they were recovered. And because the dry docks were not destroyed, they were repaired. And a majority of the ships that were damaged in the Pearl Harbor attack actually completed the war afloat. Cool. Number two, oil fields. What do ships run on? They run on oil. Where was the oil stored? In Hawaii. The Japanese failed to hit our major oil stores on the island of Oahu. Had they destroyed those oil fields, the United States Navy, you know where the next gas station was? San Francisco. San Francisco. All the way back in San Francisco. It would have completely uprooted our facilities and we would have had to have operated off the west coast of the United States. And number three, they didn't get our aircraft carriers. Aircraft carriers were relatively new to the Navy. They had first been developed around, uh, I guess, just at the end of World War I. The idea of flying ships off of the decks of uh, aircraft carriers, or actually converted battleships and cruisers with flat uh, surfaces uh, attached to them, was new. But they would come into their own during this war, this battle, this theater. And the U.S. aircraft carriers by the luck of God, we're out on maneuvers that Sunday morning. Our aircraft carriers were not hit. And as a result, they would form the spearhead and ultimately the reason why the Navy was able to commit themselves to destroying the Japanese Navy over the next four years. Three huge mistakes that essentially doomed the Japanese by nightfall on December 7th of 1941. The Japanese attack was phenomenal. It was a singular event. But that's not to say that it was an independent event. Far from it. The Japanese had full intentions of operating in the Pacific unilaterally without the interference of the United States Navy or the United States whatsoever. Their plans dated back decades from their first vision of Admiral Perry in 1855. They had visions of dominating the, the, the Asian uh, area of the Pacific. Their plan to attack Pearl Harbor was the first of many steps. In fact, that very same day, they also hit American <coughs> assets in Guam and wake. They would then make a swing through Eastern Asia, capturing Hong Kong, Singapore, the Dutch East Indies, the Philippines, and Burma. All of these strategically placed to disrupt and dislodge Western influence Western military power in the Pacific to capture an area which they called the Greater East Asian Prosperity Sphere. It was intended that this would be an economic focus under the hegemony of the Japanese Empire which would feed wealth back into Japan and control this part of the Pacific as a jumping off point to become a major player in world economics. Now it's difficult, looking at a map like this, to grasp just how big this area is. So, what we're going to do, we're going to take the United States and move it. Son of a gun! Look at the size of that area. Enormous. We could fit, I conservatively say, three United States land masses, continental United States, within the area. 
That was the Japanese plan. That was their intention. And they were fully on their way to doing it with their first successful hit at Pearl Harbor. Because the only country standing in their way was truly the United States. The Japanese had essentially been at war since 1931, when they first invaded China. In December of 1941, they had 51 divisions of light infantry. Compared to the United States, somewhat less. Aircraft, 5,000 airplanes of modern design. The United States, somewhat less. Not of modern design. And ships, it's a picture of the Yamato, the largest battleship ever made. The United States, even at the end of the war, had ships that were uh, something like just under 900 feet long, the Missouri, with 16 inch, uh, nine 16-inch guns. The Yamato had 18-inch guns and was somewhat larger, enormous. Their numbers, equally impressive. Aircraft carriers, battleships, all of these. The United States, well, not bad actually. Comparatively, well, we were sort of in there. Of course, Pearl Harbor took a hit on us. But the aircraft carriers remained, and that was going to be key. Yamamoto had done what he needed to do. He had struck the initial blow by the Japanese Navy against the American Navy. Now, the focus would turn to land. Japan was going to swing through Eastern Asia, capturing land, capturing islands, capturing assets. And to do this, they had a light infantry, but it was well suited for jungle warfare. They had excellent equipment. They were well trained, and they were doggone decisive. The United States, by contrast, and the Brits for that matter as well, were somewhat less prepared. The Pacific was a backwater for the United States. Certainly, we had had presence there for many, many years, particularly in the Philippines. But the resources there were small. The Equipment was old. It was subject to jungle rot because of the heat and the humidity. And worst of all, the command structure and the commanders themselves were not in the same frame of mind as the Japanese. They made many mistakes. They were slow. And they underestimated the little yellow men, who proved to be far, far more capable fighters than we had ever expected. In April of 1942, some, what, five months after Pearl Harbor, the United States needed to make a statement to show that we were not simply going to roll over and die. For those of you who have been attending these presentations, you know what presentation I'm talking about. It was led by this man. It's Lieutenant Colonel James Doolittle, but better known as Jimmy Doolittle, one of the most famous airmen of the 1930s. He was an aviator developer. He was a aircraft racer and was commissioned as a lieutenant colonel when the war broke out and led one of the most audacious plans in the early part of the war. Doolittle led a flight of 16 medium weight B-25 U.S. Army bombers. He proposed and executed the unthinkable. He would put these aircraft on an aircraft carrier and take off from the aircraft carrier. Now this is no small feat. I researched this, and it turns out that a fully loaded operational B-25 bomber required approximately 3,600 feet 
of runway to take off. Anybody want to guess what the length of a uh, uh, aircraft carrier is? One thousand. No, a little bit less. Eight hundred fifty or so in those days. Actually, I, I kind of give it away up here. Oh, wow. Less than a quarter of what is required to take off. Needless to say, I hate that phrase because if it's needless to say, I shouldn't say it. <laughs> It was purely voluntary if you wanted to try to join Doolittle's force. They were going to take off of a rocking and rolling aircraft carrier deck less than a quarter of the length required by specifications and they were going to fly across the ocean yeah. and bomb Japan. They would then land in occupied China and be done with it. Now, the idea actually worked through extensive training, secret training, flying into a stiff headwind and stripping the planes down to their minimum weight, they actually took off and all 16 took to the air. Unfortunately, they took off 150 miles earlier than they had intended. Uh, because as they were approaching the coast of Japan, they were suddenly sighted by Japanese fishing trawlers, and they feared that the Japanese trawlers would send word back, hey, there are big American ships out here. And so they launched early, and they had to fly an extra 150 miles, which caused them to not have all of the range that they needed, and most of the ships uh, were able to at least make it to China, but crashed. Uh, and most of the crews did survive. Several were captured by the Japanese and executed. Um, but they, uh, they were able to actually bomb Tokyo and other major cities. The, 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 the damage was minimal. It was superficial. It was purely propaganda. But the fact that the Japanese looked up and saw American airplanes bombing them in, June of, uh, in, in April of 1942 was shocking. And it, gave a huge boost of morale to the United States. The Japanese said they must have come from Midway. There's no way, I mean, what, they couldn't have taken off an aircraft carrier, right? So Midway became of intense interest, particularly to Yamamoto, who now realized his mistake of not having gotten those aircraft carriers and he was looking at uh, Midway. If they can bomb from there, they can get us from anywhere. So he wanted to get back at Midway, and that would come into play here uh, shortly. George Marshall was the U.S. Army uh, Chief of Staff in Washington, and he was President Roosevelt's main military advisor. He quickly threw together a military structure to face the threats from Japan. And he did this by creating what was called the AB, let's see, the ABDA. Oh, it's not showing up. No. No. ABDA. Uh, America, Britain, Dutch, Australian Command. Because those were the Allied forces that were in the area. He had two major players. He had the British general, uh, General Alexander Wavell, or Wavell, and the American icon, Douglas MacArthur, who was in the Philippines. The British would bear the first brunt as the Japanese came flooding down through Eastern Asia. And the 89,000 British troops faced 70,000 Japanese troops landing far up on the Malay Peninsula and started working their way down to the fortress of Singapore. Singapore was considered the most secure fortress city in all of Southwest Asia. Well, secure or not, the Japanese rolled back until the uh, Japanese moved down. They managed to sink two of the British, uh, the British uh, most modern battleships. They destroyed them by aircraft dropping bombs, and they captured Singapore on the 15th of February. It was a shock to the world uh, that the Japanese had been able to do this. 
MacArthur was not much better off. MacArthur was ensconced in uh, Manila, Philippines, and within hours, hours of the uh, Pearl Harbor attack, Manila and the Philippines were subject to Japanese air attacks as well. And they quickly knocked out enough American aircraft to build up a sizable, enormous uh, advantage in Japanese aircraft over U.S. aircraft. They landed, and by Christmas of 1941, they had captured Manila. American forces retreated into the Bataan Peninsula and the small island of Corregidor, which was a fortress guarding the bay. They withdrew into, into that, and they held out until they were finally uh, overcome by, uh, let's see, what was the date? Well, I think it was 1st of February. It was, it was right underneath here, so we couldn't see it. Anyway, the Americans captured numbered 75,000, and they were set off on a 55-mile... Come on. Okay, I'm not getting action here. Peggy, can you advance that, please? I'm advancing for you. The 75,000, 55 miles. Click it one more time. 7,000 of them died. It was a brutal, brutal march. They were marched on foot, given very little in the way of food or water, uh, and it was uh, several were executed on their way. Click one more time, we can see pictures of what they looked like by the end of the war. They, those that survived were walking skeletons. Click again. Now, <coughs> Doug MacArthur did not actually experience the Bataan Death March. <coughs> he was perfectly willing to do that and be captured with his men, but he got word from Franklin Roosevelt himself, who ordered the general, you will leave. And by a combination of PT boat and B-17, he was flown to Australia to take command of the American forces in the southern part of Asia. That happened on March 12th. He earned the unfortunate nickname from his troops as Dugout Doug. And uh, he did vow that he would return. Okay. So the Japanese now have captured this whole area down here. They've established superiority. They now have three options. They can. Uh, the British exited there. OK. With the British exiting, we now had Douglas MacArthur, and we set up a Navy commander, Chester Nimitz, who was in command of Pearl Harbor after the attack, and they divided the area into two regions that each commander would, would manage. MacArthur would own the southern part of Asia, the large archipelagos, Philippines, New Guinea, and of course Australia. But the Pacific is water, and so it was clear that much of the war was going to be on the water, and so Chester Nimitz was given a lion's share of the rest of the Pacific to manage. The two of them would execute competing parallel movements towards vectors towards Japan. This would come to be called island hopping because they were obviously going to go from island to island in their approach to Japan. Okay. Now, the Japanese options. They could move towards India, where Britain had moved their operations. They could move straight down and capture Australia. Or they could go for Midway and Hawaiian Islands with a possible threat to the Western United States. The India was put on indefinite hold. Yamamoto had a preference for going for Midway because obviously the B-25s that had bombed Tokyo in April had come from Midway. 
But he was overruled, and the decision was to move down and try to capture Australia. The first attacking point would be the port, the, uh, the, uh, the city of Port Moresby on the southern coast of New Guinea. As many of the operations would, this led to a large sea battle. And the Battle of Coral Sea took place in early May of 1942 to support the capturing of Port Moresby as a jumping off point to capture Australia. This was largely a combat between aircraft of aircraft carriers uh, between the Japanese and the Americans. The Americans had two aircraft carriers, the Japanese three. And in the process of these two days of May 7th and 8th, there was a loss, a complete loss of two aircraft carriers, one on each side, the Japanese aircraft carrier Shoho and the American aircraft carrier Lexington. And then both sides had damaged aircraft carriers the Shikaku, and down here, this is the Yorktown. The battle broke off at that point. And so it could be considered that this was a tactical draw. Both sides had lost an aircraft carrier. Both sides had damaged aircraft carriers. But the Japanese canceled their attack on Port, Port Moresby. And in that respect, it saved Australia from being attacked or captured. And so it could and is largely considered a strategic victory. With Australia saved for the moment, Japanese attention now turned to, wait, Midway. Yamamoto wanted to capture Midway, not just because of the B-25 bombers from uh, from Doolittle, but because it gave him an opportunity to attack the U.S. carriers that he had missed at Pearl Harbor. He could attack Midway, he could attack Hawaiian Islands, but most importantly, he would sink the American carriers. And that would make a decisive dent in all American defense in the Pacific. Battle of Midway took place on the 4th of June of 1942. And Yamamoto's intentions were to sneak in there. It was critical that the Americans not know this was coming. He would lure the carriers into his trap. He would fix them in place with the aircraft and bring his battleships into play to sink them. Nimitz, however, had two advantages. The first was the Yorktown, which had been damaged down in Coral Sea, was quickly brought back to Pearl Harbor and was repaired. So it could actually move under its own power. This was done in an incredible amount of time, and it sailed and was present at Midway. But even more important was that the Americans had managed to break Japanese code, and they knew the Japanese were headed for Midway. Knowing what the other player is going to do is a huge advantage. I mean, think of any football game. If you know what the other quarterback is going to do, it makes it easy to defend. And Nimitz knew what Yamamoto had planned. As a result, the Battle of Midway became a huge disaster for the Japanese. The Japanese had four carriers to the American three. And it was a decisive, it should have been a decisive advantage. But over the course of, the of one day, the 4th of June, they managed to lose not one, not two, not three, but four. All four of their character car carriers were destroyed and sunk. Americans lost the Yorktown. It had managed to crawl its way back from Coral Sea, get repaired in a matter of days, sail out and compete and successfully uh, uh, participate, but it was ultimately sunk. Uh, actually, it was, it was scuttled. It was so badly damaged, American forces sank the Yorktown. Nevertheless, we had absolutely decimated Amer uh, Japanese carriers, which would prove decisive. It could be said that from this point forward, for the rest of the war, the Japanese could not win. That might be overstating it a little bit. It might not. The fact was they were damaged seriously by not having character carriers. <laughs> 
Yamamoto was thwarted from his plans. Worse than thwarted, he was now crippled by losing his carriers. And Midway had now marked the emergence of a new ship to be the queen of all naval battles. For centuries, battleships had been the lead ship. Reaching its pinnacle with the largest battleships ever made. But in the Battle of Midway, not a single battleship came into play. In fact, neither fleet even saw each other during the battle, other than through the cockpits of the aircraft. The aircraft carrier from June 4th of 1942 to today is the premier naval battle wagon. Focus now shifted to the archipelagos along the southern route, and this meant MacArthur primarily. The Guadalcanal campaign and the New Guinea campaign would carry the forces from June of 43 all the way until February, February of 44. And these would again have the Japanese threatening Australia in these two locations. To the far west, of uh, the Solomon Islands. The island of Guadalcanal had been developed by the Japanese as a aircraft uh, landing strip area. They could put their heavy bombers here and they could threaten the Australians and move their ships down. This was going to be critical. The United States did not want them to do that and a huge battle ensued on, on uh, Guadalcanal. Went on for months. It also included naval battles in what was called the slot. But by the end of the campaign, the United States had captured Guadalcanal and started moving up the archipelago towards the Bismarck Sea. The Japanese also attempted to capture Port Moresby again, but failed. And in fact, the United States forces, the Allied forces, pushed across New Guinea and captured Buna closing off the, that end of New Guinea for any Japanese advance. An interesting propaganda-ish event occurred during the campaign in New Guinea. Yamamoto, nope, I'll cover Yamamoto moment. There was a cleanup operation. For Midway, Yamamoto had created a diversion of capturing American land in Alaska the Attu and Kiska Islands. And it, it was cleaned up in August of 1943 when American forces went up there to knock out the Japanese that were still up there. And when they arrived, they found the Japanese had already left. They saw no point and uh, they left all their, uh, their billets and whatnot. So that closed out the furthest north attempt to uh, expand Japanese empire. New Guinea continued the operation from Guadalcanal to the east. Navy had operations just to the west of Guadalcanal and moving up to Bougainville and attacking Rabal, a Japanese base. MacArthur picked up the same, attacking it. Samoa and Lai, neutralizing Rabal. This was an interesting thing. They never captured Rabal, the United States didn't, but they completely isolated it. And for the rest of the war, the Japanese were stuck, not able to get supplies, not able to do anything. They were just isolated there. It was a uh, opportunity to simply skip past them, remove them from any consequence, and move on up the coast, which they did going up here to the Admiralties and then beyond. During the New Guinea campaign, we had, as I mentioned, had broken the Japanese code. One day, the Japanese code announced that General Yamamoto, Admiral Yamamoto, was going to make courtesy visits to his pilots in New Guinea and tell them what a great job they were doing against the Americans. Well, the code was instantly read by the Americans. 
and a flight of P-38s were gathered on the day that Yamamoto was flying, and they met his aircraft. They fired on it, they shot it down, and Yamamoto was killed. Apparently, the, uh, the, the, the architect of Pearl Harbor was found still strapped in his seat, leaning up against a tree, shot, and uh, looked like he was asleep. So while Douglas MacArthur continued to move from the south, Chester Nimitz moved from the north. Doing his island hopping, he went from the Gilbert Islands, Tarawa, Makin, the Marshall Islands, Kwajalein. I once worked for a general officer who constantly threatened to send me to Kwajalein. Okay. I had no idea what it was. Now that I do, I kind of wonder what I did to upset him. <laughs> really? um, and then on to the Mar Marianas. The Marianas were defended, of course, as were all of these, but the price and the toll on the Japanese forces was now becoming evident. They had lost a lot of equipment. They had lost a lot of experienced flyers and soldiers, and their tactics were becoming more like suicide attacks. The trade-off between American forces and Japanese forces became overwhelming. You can't see the figures down here, but it was a huge advantage in American forces and the losses of the Japanese. The Marianas were especially important because now, with the capture of islands that were relatively close to the Japanese mainland, we could bring in our B-29 bombers that had ranges of about 5,600 miles, and we can now bomb the Japanese mainland without using an aircraft carrier. Now, all during the time that MacArthur was coming up from here, Nimitz was coming across from here, there was still action going on in the China-Burma-India theater. It was a backwater. It was, uh, the Japanese had made their greatest moves in the early part of the war, and in May of 1942, they occupied most of Burma, and they were confronted by American forces and British forces uh, supporting Chiang Kai-shek in China, but they had a firm hold on Burma. This steadily declined because of their, the Japanese inability to reinforce, to resupply. By May of 1944, two years later, it looked something like this. <laughs> and the Japanese gave up their hold in the CBI uh, theater. Nimitz had moved now within striking distance of Japan. MacArthur did the same. He was now poised to fulfill his promise to return to the Philippines. And so he did. In October of 1944, American forces landed at Leyte. This led to a great naval battle as well, the Battle of Leyte Gulf. But he truly did come fulfill his promise to return. This photograph, I understand, was taken about 20 times until it met with MacArthur's satisfaction. <laughs> they had uh, they had photographers there on the beach, and MacArthur kept coming aboard. He kept saying, did you get the right light? Was it okay? And anyway, so it looks dramatic, but it was absolutely staged. Nevertheless, he did. He did return to the Philippines. Now, the Battle of Leyte Gulf, uh, in which Japanese naval forces met with American naval forces, again demonstrated Great frustration on the part of the Japanese. They were outgunned, they were outmaneuvered, they were out experienced, they had lost some of their best people, and they turned to some rather uh, extreme uh, tactics. The most famous and most notorious of which was that of the kamikaze. <laughs> 
The kamikaze were planes that were laden with bombs, explosives, whatever, and slammed into the side of American warships, uh, obviously killing the pilot. It was purely a, uh, a suicide mission, uh, but they had come to that point. They believed in their cause, and they reached back into their own history to come up with the name of Kamikaze. Anybody know where that came from? Divine Wind. Divine Wind. In 1274, the nephew of Genghis Khan, Kublai Khan, attempted to capture Japan. Uh, he failed, but he only failed because as his ships sailed across the strait, uh, the Sea of China, and approached Japan, a huge typhoon came up out of nowhere and blew them all over the place and it thwarted the invasion. Until 1945, Japan mainland would never be threatened with invasion again. So for 700 years, it worked well. And so the great, uh, the great divine wind, the tsunami, was the name given to the aircraft which would be guided by divine wind to destroy American ships, to try to stop and stave off uh, the American attack. It was in part successful. Some 34 ships, American ships, were actually sunk and countless others were damaged. But ultimately, uh, the United States outproduced any such losses uh, and overwhelmed the Japanese as they would out overwhelm the Germans as well in the European theater story for another day. The Japanese did what would be expected. They shifted forces from the north part of uh, the Philippines, Luzon, down to try to counter the American landing at Leyte, and as a result that opened up an American landing in Luzon. And by February of 1945, Manila was reached and recaptured. And for the remainder of the war, from February of 45 till August of 45, it was a mopping up action of just trying to clean up uh, the Japanese soldiers who were still essentially abandoned on the Philippines. We now had MacArthur in the Philippines. We had uh, Nimitz in the Marianas, but he did two more attacks. He captured Iwo Jima and Okinawa, small islands that were that much closer to the Japanese mainland. Uh, the campaigns for each were similar, and so it's sufficient to simply show how Okinawa unfolded. The Japanese established a very strong defense on one part of the island, and with fanatical, fanatical determination, they fought back against the American forces with huge losses, Americans 12,000 killed, Japanese 77,000 killed uh, over the course of uh, April, May, and June of 1945 until they, uh, they finally surrendered. And of course there was also naval action around here as well. With the capture of Okinawa and Iwo Jima, the United States heavy bombers, the B-29s, now had free reign over all of the Japanese mainland. Uh, and these were no small firecrackers that they were dropping. Them's big bombs. But high-level bombing that they were like the Americans were doing in Germany were not as effective against the Japanese uh, because of their dispersion, because of the, uh, the construction of their buildings. The Japanese used a lot of bamboo. And so the high-level bombing was not as effective. What they went down to instead were incendiaries and these were terribly effective. Obviously you don't get a lot of accuracy with fires and the losses numbered in the quarter to a third of a million people, uh, many of them civilians, over the course of January through August of 1945. I would be remiss <laughs> if I did not recognize the contribution of the U.S. Secret Service, uh, you know, the, the silent service, the submarines, as we have the silver side right outside. Now, there were a great many problems 
with technology early on in the war. And from 1942 to 43, our torpedoes just were not working right. And so the effect was limited, but that was soon corrected. And from uh, 43 then to 44, half of Japan's merchant marine was sunk. Half. This was done through 1,600 patrols. Uh, and as you can see, nearly 700 warships and over 2,000 merchant marines of the Japanese were sunk to the bottom. Island nations don't survive that way. Hitler had the same idea against the British, but he was never able to pull it off. We did. But what you can't see underneath this bar was that the Japanese did not reciprocate because their assets were limited enough that they really didn't attack our merchant marine. Uh, they mostly attacked our warships, uh, but they simply couldn't keep up with American development and building of ships, and their policy was just not nearly as effective as ours. The stage was now set. Invade Japan. Operation Overthrow, or Downfall, was scheduled to begin in December of 1945. They expected it would run about two months. It would be two separate operations. One would be from the South, uh, Operation Olympic, and Operation something else. Yeah. It would take about six million Allied forces. They expected to face about 36 million Jap Japanese, not just military, but the entire population of Japan was ready to defend its island nation. Estimated casualties were going to be horrific, in the millions, in the millions. For the Allies, for the Japanese, it would be a bloodbath. A few years back, there was a, uh, a U.S. congressman who was afraid that Guam would tip over if too many people were put on it. Yeah. Well, this would certainly flood the island of Japan with blood. And the American public held its breath, as will we. And Bill, advance, please, Peggy. Harry S. Truman had an audacious decision to make. He was facing operation, the operation to capture Japan with the loss of horrendous amounts of life on both sides. But he did have an option. It was an option that had been developed in secret since the beginning of the war. In July of 1945, it had been successfully tested in the far reaches of the New Mexico desert and was proven capable. And it would come to be known by the target that was its first point of attack. Nuclear bombs, never before used in combat, never since. Haven't seen the news lately, but I hope that's still the case. Mm. It came in two designs. This was called Little Boy. It had a yield between uh, 13 and 17 kilotons, which is nothing compared to what could be done today. But then, that one bomb was highly effective. Dropped on the, the city of Hiroshima. This is the before, and this is the after. Kind of like taking a uh, and sweeping a, a chalkboard. The Japanese were expected to capitulate, surrender, give up. They did not. Three days later, the second U.S. design, Fat Man, with a yield between 19 and 23 kilotons, was dropped on Nagasaki. Same effect. Devastating changed the world as we knew it, still. Compared to the millions, 200,000 seems like a bargain, but still that's 200,000 lives snuffed out. It is still controversial to this day. Was it moral? Was it ethical? 
Well, even as far away as uh, General Sherman said, war is hell. Left for another discussion day. The Soviets took advantage of this pause between Hiroshima on the 6th of August and Nagasaki on the 9th of August to finally throw in and declare war on Japan on the 8th of August. Well, you know, if you look at what happened in Europe, they bore the brunt of the Nazi war machine. It could be argued that they truly defeated the Nazi war machine uh, with some help from us. But they did come in on the very last day uh, and declared war on Japan. Japan did capitulate, sued for peace the following day, and Russia got credit for being on the winning side and was able to not only get back losses that they had lost in the Russo-Japanese War of 1905, but they also got the control of half of a peninsula off the coast of, uh, off the Chinese coast known as Korea. North Korea happened because of that because they signed up at the last minute. On the 2nd of September, the battleship Missouri was moored, was anchored in Tokyo Harbor, and with representatives of all Allied forces, the Japanese came aboard and signed the formal surrender, ending World War II in the Pacific. and the great hope that this would be the end of all war. It had taken four brutal years of devastation, death, destruction, and the introduction of a new type of warfare that we have yet to understand. But in the end, the fighting did what it needed to do. It sank the rising sun. Questions? Wake up! Yeah. <coughs> I have a microphone here so that our people can hold. His hand came up first, then we'll get you. Okay, one second, let me hand you the microphone. Thank you. Um, you uh, mentioned that between the attack on Pearl Harbor and the attack on the air facility, the Army facilities at the Philippines was just a matter of hours. Um, growing up, I had misunderstood this because of the dateline mm -hmm. and had taken it that because then it happened in the 8th in the Philippines. The attack was December 8th. And I had grown up with many, many people telling me that MacArthur was asleep on the job. A whole day had mm -hmm. gone by mm -hmm. between the attack in Pearl Harbor and he should have been ready for the attack in the Philippines. And it wasn't until I was well into my adulthood that it, that it dawned on me that it was almost simultaneous. But it was simply the fact that it was already the 8th in, in, in Japan when, in the, the Far East when that had happened. So I'm glad you mentioned that it was just a few hours difference. But Eight to ten hours. Eight to ten. Now, it is still it is still argued. What was MacArthur doing? They had word. They knew that Pearl Harbor had been hit eight to ten hours earlier, and yet his his forces on the Philippines were caught completely unprepared for the attack. He didn't disperse. He didn't he didn't go on high alert. The, it was still a criticism he lived with that uh, he was not prepared for what he should have been. But yeah, it was the same day. Sir? You had one photograph, I think, that appeared to show uh, an airplane taking off from a submarine. Did, did I see that correctly? The Japanese and later Americans did have float craft that could take off from submarines. They were, decon they were taken apart. They could be assembled on the, on, the, on, the, um, on the top of the submarine, and yes, they could take off. So they were sto stowed in, internally until they were needed. Yes. Oh, thank you. Could I add a little bit to that? Um, the two submarines that they had built by the end of the war were the I-400s. And it was an ingenious design because they had put in an area 
so that they could start up and warm the engines inside and they had an entire air filtration system. The United States got two of them at the end of the war and we actually um, re-engineered them and that led to many of our advancements in the submarine service and both of them were eventually sunk in the Pacific so that no one else would get that in intelligence. Hmm. They were intentionally sunk. Intentionally sunk after we had re-engineered them. I know when I was a kid, I built a submarine, a model that was a U.S. submarine in the 1950s, which actually had a cruise missile which came up and launched off the deck. And it was actually configured for that, hmm. uh, the Regulus uh, cruise missile. Back and back. You mentioned the three colossal blunders at Pearl Harbor made by the Japanese. Yeah. That has always totally amazed me how they could make those blunders. What, what, what do you think is the explanation? The Japanese never expected, never expected to be so successful. Uh, when they pulled off the attack and they found that, uh, that the Americans were completely unaware, they were holding services on the deck of the uh, of the Arizona, for God's sake. They were out playing baseball and whatnot. They were so successful, uh, they, I'm sure what happened, having been in command positions, you try to go with what's coming across the radio and read what's happening. I'm sure the Admiral in charge, Nagumo, thought, this is just too good to be true. Let's get out of here while we've still got everything. And they pulled back from, uh, from hitting the, uh, the world and other stuff. The Japanese did that several times during the war. Departed the area before they uh, had an overwhelming success. They did it off Guadalcanal and they did it at the uh, uh, Lake A Gulf. Midway as well. Uh, at Midway, Midway they were caught in a position good. where they were trying to attack Midway with, uh, um, with bombs to attack the land as well as use the same aircraft to load them up with bombs to attack the ships. Uh, and ultimately, they decided uh, to withdraw. Yamamoto decided not to attack with his uh, battleships, which were still 100 miles off because he feared that uh, they had lost the element of surprise. So yeah, command is a, uh, is a sketchy thing. Uh, on the uh, Pearl Harbor attack, wasn't there a third wave that was not launched? Yeah. Well, there were two waves. There was a one at seven that hit at 7:50, one that hit at 8:15, and there was supposed to be a third attack. And Nagumo pulled back from that. Well, could that have been the one for logistics? Possibly. Possibly. Uh, take care. Take care of the anti-aircraft and everything else first. And yeah. Get the logistics. Makes sense. Makes absolute sense. Uh, Nagumo was apparently not well thought of. He was a, a little bit tentative as a commander. Uh, he was not a Bull Halsey or a George Patton, uh, and he was capable, but yeah, he did not launch the third attack. Also, if I understand, he was not a great supporter of aircraft carriers. <laughs> still, felt, yeah, still felt the battleship ruled the sea, and you know he saw the function for the aircraft carriers, and certainly at the Pearl, he respected their abilities more, but he still he was never he was never the aircraft carrier is a future fan um, that others thought. But for their credit, if if they knocked out all the ships, and you know the dry docks wouldn't matter mm -hmm. because you can't fix things that are sunk. And if you put a stop to them, and 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 if you remember, their plan was in in six months if we can establish a firm control build this empire, lock it in place, the, the West won't try right. to over to stop us. They'll sue for peace and we'll get what we want. Um, but the in the oil fields, for what ships if they're all gone? But you're right, if you got those, it would have made a difference. One of the, I hinted at, I, I mentioned briefly that many of the American ships, most American ships, were sunk in the shallow of the harbor. And so they were recovered. Uh, whereas outside of the harbor, they would have been completely lost, as you point out. The aircraft was uh, a new toy and was really not, I mean, there were many old 
old school admirals on both sides that did not think much of the aircraft carrier. Yamamoto had started out as a battleship guy and had converted to uh, aviation as a, uh, as a resource. But even on the American side, uh, Billy Mitchell in 1921 proved that aircraft could sink a battleship, and that was thought unthinkable at the time. But he was able to send uh, uh, little aircraft out and drop in the water, and the concussion managed to damage the plates of the Ostfriedland, a uh, captured German uh, cruiser, and sink it, which amazed people. Uh, in 19, and I just, as I was doing research for this, in 1935 there was a, uh, a war game held by the United States Navy, and the uh, the admiral in charge of the Japanese forces committed an attack from the air on a Sunday by surprise and won. And he was told that'll never happen. Get back and stop it. Stop. Stop raising you know issues that will never happen. The British. The British at uh, Taranto, Italy, uh, launched a uh, attack by their carrier planes on the Italian fleet. And that's what taught the, the Japanese how to attack our battleships at Pearl Harbor. Yes. And incredibly, the Japanese, the, uh, the British aircraft were swordfish, which were biplanes. They yes. flew at about the speed of, well, me walking up this, this aisle. They, they're very slow, but they were able to get in and, uh, and knock out the Italian fleet and effectively uh, scuttle the Italian uh, uh, control of the Mediterranean. Yes. Thank you, voice from the on. <laughs> Another crazy thing that is hard to explain. The Japanese, I don't believe, I don't think most people believe, knew that Hitler was going to declare war. So they could have been facing us alone, facing them in the Pacific without being, as it turned out, you know, we put kind of the Pacific on the side burner and went after uh, Hitler because he declared war and because of what was going on in Europe, of course. I think the Japanese did know it. They had signed a uh, tripartite pact with Italy and Germany in May of 1940, uh, and the stipulation was that attack one, you attack us all. And so Hitler did declare war only, um, what, four, no, 11, yeah, it was like four days. days afterwards, or something like 11th that. Eleventh of December, he declares war in the United States. Yeah, a little foolhardy, but then he was going to even go beyond that when he decided to fight a two-front war by turning on uh, mm -hmm. Russia, Russia in June of 1941. Yeah. So. Do we have any last questions, Cliff? Go ahead. Well, uh, just to make a comment, uh, you showed the uh, Battle of uh, the Coral Sea as one of the one of the turning points. Uh, stopping the Japanese attack on New Guinea yeah. uh, and uh, eventually uh, Australia. The coincidence is that uh, we defeated the Japanese carrier force on May 6th and it was a big victory the same day that Corregidor fell and that was the end of the uh, campaign in the Philippines, May 6th. Good point. Well, on that note, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. It's been a wonderful series, and as always, kudos to yes. our